Hello, everybody. Just wanted to jump on and say, hi, I'm Lynn from Stone Rudolph and Henry. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes and giving um, everybody a chance to jump on here. So uh, just hang tight with us and we will get started here shortly. still see some people trying to get on, so we'll give them a chance to get on here. Just hang tight with us for just a few more seconds. Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. I think there may be a few more to jump on with us here uh, in just a second, but I want to welcome you to Stone Rudolph and Henry's uh, 2020 tax update webinar. Oh, what a year it has been. <laughs> um, I'm sure that many of you have been affected uh, by this year's uh, COVID situation, whether it's through a small business loan or having to work from home or you know, possibly even uh, being out of work for a short while, but uh, I'm sure in some way um, you have been affected and uh, that it may affect your tax return for this year too. So we wanted to help you through that and uh, give you some education and information on what you might be able to do to change that before the end of the year. Um, I did wanna let you know if you have any questions during the presentation, um, there is a chat box. If you move your mouse or uh, run your finger over your screen, you will see some icons to pop up either at the top or bottom. There should be a chat box there. So just click on that and type in your question. And we hope that uh, we'll have enough time at the end to maybe answer a few of those. If not, then um, our speaker will get those answered and back to you by email as soon as he can. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker to you. He's one of our own. It's Marcus Marotti. He is our tax team supervisor located in our Brentwood office. And he has been with Stone Rudolph and Henry for six and a half years, and we're very fortunate to have him with us. So he's gonna give you a lot of information, so hang on. Uh, Marcus, we're ready for you anytime. All right, cool. Thanks, Lynn, I appreciate it. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so what we're gonna look at first are some of the items that are, <clears throat> excuse me, normally indexed for inflation every year. Um, and then we'll go and move forward into some individual changes, um, some changes that impact business returns. Uh, and then we'll kind of close out looking at some of the proposed changes uh, going forward. So uh, without further ado, um, we'll go ahead and look at the income tax rates for single returns first. Um, the, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the brackets for 2019 and then the right-hand side is the 2020 tax brackets. Uh, as you can kind of tell glancing through them, the brackets themselves are remaining unchanged. So you still have the 10%, 12%, all the way up to the maximum rate of 37% uh, for 2020. So the only thing that really has changed for 2020 is the dollar amounts for the brackets themselves. Uh, they are indexed for inflation every year. So you're gonna stay in a lower bracket, slightly longer uh, in 2020 than you would in 2019. Uh, but no, you know, huge tax savings here. It's just a, um, you know, small change for uh, to keep pace with inflation. Uh, moving on to the married filing joint rates, uh, kind of more of the same. Uh, rates themselves have not changed. Um, you're looking at a slightly wider tax bracket than you would have had in 2019. And for example, 10% is going to go up to 19,750 versus 19,400 in 2019. Uh, and finally, the head of household rates. So these are um, individuals who uh, generally are single parents. Uh, so if you have a taxpayer that has a qualifying child that lives with them, 
during the year they can qualify for this favorable tax status. Uh, as you can tell, the brackets themselves are you know, a little bit uh, wider, um, so they stay in a smaller bracket for longer than they would filing as a single individual. Uh, so a little bit favorable status there. Uh, the standard deduction uh, is going to go increase for 2020. So remember the standard deduction, everyone gets a standard deduction. Uh, if you can elect to itemize, if you have more itemized deductions than the standard. Uh, so we'll look at that every year as you prepare a return to see what's more advantageous for the taxpayer to do. So uh, for 2020, the uh, standard deduction for a single person or married filing separate is 12,400. So up slightly over uh, 2019 when it was 12,200. Uh, they've already released the uh, rate for 2021. So this would be you know, 12,550. Uh, for 2021. Uh, head of household will get a similar adjustment. Uh, it's going to increase by about $300 for 2020. Uh, Mary filing joint will increase by about $400 uh, to 24800 So again, if you, if you don't itemize, and these are the same reductions for the 2020 tax year. Uh, we'll look at the mileage rates next. So for 2020, the business rate is going to decrease slightly to 57 and a half cents uh, per mile. So this is mostly self-employed and business owners who, you know, are meeting clients or you know driving around for you know conferences or some kind of business-related purpose get this deduction per mile. Um, it's kind of indexed uh, not only for inflation, but they look at the price of gas, other factors go into determining what that rate is for the year. Uh, I checked this morning, the 2021 rates have not yet been published. Typically, it's uh, at the latter half of the year where that gets um, sent out to everyone. Uh, so it's not yet available yet uh, for 2021, but for 2020, it's 57 and a half cents for business. Uh, charitable mileage is uh, going to remain unchanged at 14 cents per mile. Uh, that one actually is not adjusted every year. Uh, it takes a congressional action in order for that rate to change. So. And technically, it's not yet published, but unless Congress decides otherwise, it's going to remain at 14 cents uh, per mile for charitable. Um, so if you're driving around for some sort of charitable purpose, you can actually deduct that if you itemize. Uh, and then the medical and moving rate is going to go down slightly from 20 cents per mile in 2019 to 17 cents per mile in 2020. Um, so if you are you know, driving to a doctor's office or a hospital or you know, something uh, akin to that, uh, that actually adds to your medical expenses. Um, so if you itemize and can deduct your medical expenses, then you actually can count your mileage as well. Um, I left moving on there for now, uh, but that has actually changed as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, to where moving expenses are really only deductible under, for members of the military. Um, under limited circumstances can actually deduct that. So as long as they're not reimbursed for part of that mileage, then they actually can deduct that on their return. But otherwise, moving expenses have kind of been uh, wiped out for everyone else. Um, and next, we'll look at the Social Security taxable wage base for 2020. Um, it increased by about 5,000 over 2019. Uh, so that Social Security wage base is the amount that self-employed individuals and employees pay in Social Security tax. So they'll pay that 6.5% or 12.4% if they're self-employed um, on that income up to 137700 for 2020. That anything over that amount is not subject to, to Social Security tax, uh, but a Medicare tax you know, is uh, indefinite. There's no limit for Medicare tax. Uh, but that is by far the smaller one. You know, employees pay 1.45% in Medicare uh, and 2.9% for self-employed individuals. Uh, and the 2021 rate is actually there as well. It'll go out another $5,000 in 2021. Okay, uh, next look at the estate and gift tax exemption uh, for 2020. It's going to increase by about $180,000 for single people up to 11.58 million uh, married. Uh, it's actually 23.16 million for 2020. Uh, so one of my goals in my lifetime is to be subject to the estate tax. Um, not quite there yet, but I would love to get there. I hope all you guys are. 
Um, but that, that, what that means is essentially, if you are a single person and you pass away in 2020, uh, then the first $11.58 million of your estate would not be subject to estate tax. Um, then for 2020 and for 2021, the annual gift tax exclusion uh, is going to remain at $15,000. So you can gift up to $15,000 per person per year uh, without needing to file a gift tax return. Uh, and then if you're married, you and your spouse can each do $15,000. So in effect, it's a $30,000 limit per person per year uh, for a married couple. And then, of course, you could always do more than that limit um, if you wanted to during the year to a, uh, to a person you just need to file a gift tax return. Um, and there's really no tax consequences, uh, usually. Uh, it just reduces your gift tax or your annual or your lifetime estate exclusion. Uh, so it would reduce your $11.58 million uh, estate exemption uh, for doing a gift of more than $15,000 to one person during the year. Okay. Uh, next, look at the IRA contribution. Uh, these are going to remain unchanged uh, for 2020. So you're uh, eligible to contribute up to $6,000 into an IRA during the year. Uh, a catch-up contribution is available. If you are age 50 or older during the year, you can actually do $7,000 for the year. And then IRAs, you actually have until April 15th of the following year to fund your IRA for that tax year. So for example, in 2020, uh, you could you have until April 15th of 2021 to fund your IRA uh, for 2020. Okay, uh, next look at 401k and 403b deferrals. So the employee deferral, deferral will go up about $500 from 2019 uh, to where the employee can defer up to 19,500. Uh, if, again, if they're over age 50 or age 50 or higher, uh, they can do the catch-up contribution and do an extra $6,500 uh, for 2020. So up slightly over 2019's amount. Uh, simple IRAs, um, again, have increased slightly for 2020. Uh, the employee can now defer up to $13,500. Uh, it's going to remain unchanged for 2021. Uh, the catch-up contribution it remains unchanged from 19, so it's $3,000 uh, catch-up for employees age 50 or older during the year. Uh, SEP IRAs uh, increased slightly from 2019, uh, so for 2020 they can contribute up to $57,000 uh, into a SEP during the year. Uh, there's no catch-up contribution for a SEP plan. The SEPs are entirely funded by the employer. Uh, so there's no employee deferral uh, as part of the SEP. All right, <clears throat> so now we get into the first uh, kind of change that was made as part of the CARES Act uh, when it was passed, I believe, back in March of 2020. Um, they One of the provisions of the CARES Act allowed for a favorable tax treatment on up to $100,000 of what they call coronavirus-related distributions from a retirement plan. Uh, so we'll look at the next slide of what those kind of benefits are, but individuals can qualify for this treatment um, if they meet any of the following criteria. Uh, so if the taxpayer, spouse, or dependent uh, test positive for the virus, uh, then they qualify or if the uh, taxpayer can demonstrate that they experience adverse financial consequences uh, from being quarantined, laid off, having their hours reduced, or if they were unable to work because they could not uh, find childcare uh, because of the virus. So if their daycare was closed and they could not make other arrangements, uh, then this also qualifies for this kind of special tax treatment they're gonna get. Um, so the distribution has to have occurred between January 1st of this year and December 30th. Uh, I'm not sure why we don't get the December 31st, um, but you know, they didn't ask me uh, about this. But so really what happened is the 10% uh, uh, early withdrawal penalty does not apply to distributions. Um, so if you are uh, age 59 and a half or younger, typically you would have a 10% penalty for taking an early distribution on a tax deferred retirement plan. Well, this is gonna be waived uh, for 2020 if you meet those criteria. 
Um, so on $100,000, you're saving a $10,000 penalty right off the top of the, you know, right off the top. Um, also, what they're going to let you do is kind of spread the income tax consequences of that distribution out over a three-year period. Um, so let's say you took out $9,000 from your IRA during 2020. Well, what you could do is you could pick up $3,000 um, a year in 2020, $3,000 in 2021, and $3,000 in 2022 uh, to kind of spread that tax out some. And it may keep you from jumping up into a higher tax bracket by, using, by being able to prorate uh, those tax consequences out. Um, and they're also going to let you repay those distributions within three years, and you can avoid that income tax consequences entirely. Um, so how that kind of works is, let's say you, um, you know, you withdrew the same $9,000, you would pick up $3,000 in 2020, $3,000 in 2021, and then you repay it as long as you're within three years of that original distribution date in 2022. Uh, well, you could go back and you would amend your return for 2020 and 2021, and then you could get a refund for the income tax that you paid um, on, this, on the distribution in those two years. Um, so kind of, you know, very, you need some, you know, cash on hand or, you know, liquid assets, and you can kind of pull from this as long as you meet those criteria. And if you were affected by COVID in those ways and need some additional income to kind of carry you through, then this, um, you know, maybe a good opportunity for you. Um, kind of along the same lines, uh, they are, uh, they're not requiring any RMDs for 2020. So if you are, you know, age 70 and a half or at least 72 now, uh, you're not required to take a distribution from your um, IRA this year. You can uh, wait until 2021 uh, to kind of take a, to take a distribution out. Uh, so another change that's not on the slide that came about as part of the CARES Act. Um, charitable contributions, there was a change uh, with this as well uh, for 2020. So in 2019, uh, there's a 60% of your adjusted gross income limitation for charitable contribution. So basically what that means is you can deduct up to 60% of your income during the year as a charitable contribution. Uh, and then any excess would just roll forward to a future tax year. Well, for 2020, they're gonna waive that um, limitation for this year. So there are some limits to that. I believe it's gotta be cash only and donor advised funds would not count, but Theoretically, uh, you could donate 100% of your tax income to a charitable contribution to a charity this year, a 501c3, uh, and wipe out your tax entirely. Um, and in addition, they have a new, what we call above the line deduction this year for charitable contributions. Uh, so an individual can deduct $300, or if you're married, $600 in a joint return um, deduction without needing to itemize. Uh, so typically, and that was kind of the problem when they went back and did this uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act or TCJA a few years ago, is they raised the standard deduction so high uh, that it's hard for people to, to benefit from doing charitable giving. Uh, this is kind of one you know, way they kind of adjusted for that. And so you are, uh, without needing to itemize, you can still get a small charitable benefit um, on your return for 2020. Okay, so also part of the CARES Act uh, passed back in March, there was a technical correction uh, for bonus depreciation or Section 168K. Uh, back, uh, in, back in 2017, they passed the Tax Cut and Job Act. They carved out um, this term for qualified improvement property. And uh, basically what that is is an improvement to an interior portion of a commercial building. Um, that is not considered to be an enlargement of that building or part of the internal structural framework of the building um, would count. So typically you see these with tenant improvements to where the, um, you know, the owner of that building is going to agree to, you know, make some kind of improvements for the tenant um, uh, as part of the lease. Uh, so a lot of those types of improvements would count as qualified improvement property. Well, the issue um, with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act is it was written in such a way that they carved out this special um, definition of improvement property, uh, but on the final version of that bill, it was not, um, uh, it was actually considered 39 year property, and then it was not eligible for bonus depreciation. So it was completely against what um, Congress intended to do 
but they finally did a technical correction and fixed that as part of the CARES Act. Um, so that provision is retroactive. Um, so it goes back to 2018 and 2019. So if they, you know, uh, it makes a clear cut now that that is a considered a 15 year asset. Uh, a lot of practitioners went ahead and considered it that way using congressional intent as their argument. Uh, but if for whatever reason you consider that to be 39 year property on your tax return, uh, you can go back and amend those returns to claim that uh, bonus depreciation or to you know, spread over 15 years instead of 39 years. So. And so again, bonus depreciation for 2020 is gonna remain at 100% of new and used property. Uh, bonus depreciation uh, can be used on most property with a 20 year class life or less. Uh, so a lot of um, like the tenant improvements would count, uh, machinery and equipment, furniture and fixtures, um, all the types of items would count for, as bonus depreciation. Uh, and so that started, it starts to phase out in 2023 to where it goes down to 80% of that to be written off uh, in the year it's placed in service instead of spreading it out. Uh, and then it kind of, you know, ticks down until 2027 to where it's zero percent. So that's how it's written now. Obviously, that could change um, in the future, but as of right now, we're getting 100% bonus depreciation until 2023. Um, Section 179 is another way that we can expense assets that are placed in service during the year without having to spread that cost out over multiple years. Um, in 2020, 2019, uh, we were allowed a million twenty thousand the maximum deduction for 179, uh, with a phase out at 2.5 million. Uh, in 2020, it uh, increases slightly to a million forty thousand. So typically, during um, <clears throat> you know tax planning or during the return preparation itself, and we look at you know what's better for the client as far as bonus depreciation or 179. Uh, you know, there are some key differences between the two. Um, you know, 179, for example, is an asset by asset basis uh, to where bonus depreciation is actually an entire asset class. Um, so, you know, for example, if you bought 10 pieces of equipment during the year, uh, 179 would let you pick and choose which ones you wanted to expense entirely uh, for tax purposes during the year, whereas bonus depreciation, you would have to take all or nothing. Um, you know, 179, you can't uh, expense to create a loss, whereas you can with bonus. Uh, and the biggest difference in the two is the fact that Tennessee does not allow bonus depreciation, but they do allow 179. Uh, so if you operate in an entity that has got some kind of liability protection, uh, like an LLC, C corporation, S corporation, uh, and you operate in the state of Tennessee, then you have to kind of walk this tightrope of uh, what makes more sense to do. Uh, theoretically, you could, you know, use bonus depreciation to wipe out your entire federal income tax, but you could be left paying a six and a half percent excise tax. So, um, a lot of planning kind of goes into this, and so it's very important to look um, to make sure that you're making the right kind of decisions when it comes to, you know, depreciating these fixed assets and how we can write more off in that first year. All right, so uh, net operating loss. This is a very, you know, pro taxpayer change that was made as part of the CARES Act. Um, so a net operating loss means that, you know, maybe your business during the year has got, um, shows a loss instead of a, a profit during the year. Or it could be that you have multiple businesses, but one business um, has got, you know, more of a loss that wipes out the rest of them uh, entirely and it has some leftover of loss. That's the what we call a net operating loss or an NOL. Uh, typically, uh, back in 2016, you had, a, you had two choices you could do when you had a, um, a net operating loss. And you could either carry them back for two tax years, or you could roll that loss forward um, up to 20 years. Well, in 2017, the TCJA disallowed I mean, loss carrybacks. Um, so you were, you could carry them forward indefinitely, but you could not carry that loss back and use it to offset your taxable income in a prior tax year. Well, the CARES Act um, is going to uh, temporarily allow us to carry those losses back uh, if you had an NOL from 2018, 2019, or 2020. Um, so, you know, for example, let's say you had a, a loss in 2020 of $50,000. 
you could either elect to carry that loss forward or you could carry it back to 2015. And let's say so you had a, um, a loss of 50,000 if you were in a 39.6% tax rate in 2015, so you get a really good year that year, you know, that could save you almost $20,000 in, uh, in tax by reducing your taxable income from 2015. Um, so it's a uh, it's very pro tax where you don't have to wait for that next tax year in order to take advantage of that loss. You could get that cash now. Uh, the downside to doing a carry back is that you can't choose which year in that five year period you want to apply that loss to. Um, so let's say, for example, in 2015, you were in a 15% bracket instead of a 39% bracket. Well, that same $50,000 loss would only save you about $7,500 in tax. Um, so it, there is some kind of decision tree and seeing what makes the most sense in order to figure out if you want to carry that loss backwards um, or to carry it forward. Um, but you do have the option on losses from 2018, 19, and 20. Okay, and something else kind of related to this that changed as part of the CARES Act was there is a limit on how much of a business loss you can use uh, against other types of income. Um, so if you uh, were single, then you can only use up to a quarter million dollars of a business loss to offset, uh, for example, wages or investment income on your return uh, as part of the tax cuts and jobs act. Um, so that has been temporarily lifted uh, for tax years 2018, 19, and 20. So if you had you know, a, a loss, a large loss on a partnership, for example, and you had a million dollar W-2, when that return was originally filed, we could only use a quarter million dollars of that loss against your W-2 wages. Well, in, for 2018, 19, and 20, we can actually go back and amend that return to claim a larger loss. Now, it probably only affects you know, a very few clients, but that opportunity is there. Um, so if you think you were affected by this, I would probably reach out to your tax practitioner and discuss with them um, whether you could take advantage of this um, temporary suspension of that limitation. Because um, theoretically, that could, it also could trigger an NOL uh, for those years, and you could carry that loss back uh, five years as well. So a little bit convoluted, but um, if you're a, you know, a, a candidate for that case, it can save you quite a bit of tax dollars uh, taking advantage of that. Okay, uh, next, these are the C Corporation tax rates. So that's gonna remain unchanged from 2019. Uh, 2020 is gonna also see a 21% uh, flat tax on corporate income tax. Now, the slide says it's uh, set to permanently, uh, the tax rate permanently set to 21%. As we all know, nothing in life is permanent, especially not in the realm of tax code. Uh, so what we mean by that is that there is nothing in the tax code that is, uh, Set to change that rate. So it doesn't expire after a certain date. There's no sunset provision to it. Um, unless Congress acts on it, that rate is set to continue at 21% um, indefinitely. Uh, but obviously, they could you know, uh, pass a bill that changes that rate whenever. Uh, but there's nothing in tax code that currently is set to change that rate. Uh, next, look at the PPP loan. Um, so we could spend you know, an entire seminar on this topic alone. Uh, in fact, we've done that a few months ago. Uh, so the only thing I really wanted to call attention to um, as far as the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program is concerned, uh, that the IRS has taken this stance. Um, they issued this notice 2020-32, at least back in August. Uh, and there's a revenue procedure they released a few weeks ago that kind of along the same line. So they're taking the stance currently that the expenses um, related to PPP loan forgiveness are not going to be deductible uh, to the extent that that amount is forgiven, um, which is basically a kind of a backdoor way of saying that that forgiveness is going to be taxed income uh, to anyone who received that forgiveness. Um, They've also gone as far as to say that it's going to be not deductible in 2020, uh, whether or not you've applied for forgiveness. So what they're meaning is that you can't uh, file your 2020 return first and then apply for forgiveness later in order to kind of shift those expenses or that income rather into 2021 instead. You know, they're gonna force us to show it in 2020, regardless of the timing of when that uh, forgiveness application is 
submitted. Um, so it's kind of against congressional intent, and there's a um, bipartisan uh, members of their so there's a bipartisan effort in Congress to get this corrected uh, to where there would not be any kind of income tax um, consequences to getting this loan forgiveness, that you would be able to extend those uh, deductions in full. Uh, but as of today, that has not happened yet. Uh, so we'll see if we get some kind of action from Congress before the you know, recess for the, um, for the holiday break, uh, or it could be next year that they may do something or they may not have passed anything. So, we're very hopeful, we're very optimistic that something will happen, but as of right now, that loan forgiveness is going to be a taxable event, and it's going to affect your 2020 tax return as it's written now. Um, okay, so Tennessee Hall Tax is next. Um, this is the asterisk uh, that Tennessee has to place next to uh, our name when we talk about not having a state income tax. Uh, 2020 is going to be the final year of the Tennessee Hall tax. Uh, they uh, passed a bill a few years ago that ratcheted that rate down from 6% uh, down 1% per year until finally we're in 2020 now and that rate decreases to 1% for 2020. So this is set to expire for 2021. So hopefully this will be the last year that we deal with this Hall tax provision. Uh, so we can finally say that we don't have a individual income tax in Tennessee and uh, without, you know, without the asterisk. Um, and then finally, I wanted to look at kind of the, um, uh, what's proposed out there as part of the uh, you know, Biden tax plan. Um, this is not by no means a comprehensive list of all the changes um, you know, that have been proposed out there. And then another caveat that none of this has been passed yet, obviously. This is just kind of you know pure speculation at this point, but I did want to call attention to it just because there are some very large changes um, that are being proposed, especially for high income taxpayers. Um, you know, for example, uh, this top line currently our top individual rate um, is 37%, and that starts at about six hundred thousand dollars of taxable income. Under the proposed tax plan, that would increase to 39.6, which was the rate, um, the highest tax rate back in 2016. Uh, but this time it would start at $400,000 of taxable income. Um, the proposed uh, CPORP tax rate would go from 21% uh, to 28%. Uh, currently, um, S corporations and other passive entities like partnerships get a 20% deduction. Um, they're a qualified business uh, as far as you know TBI is concerned uh, to where essentially they, they pay tax on 80 percent of their taxable income instead of 100 percent. Well that deduction would be eliminated for individuals with income over $400,000. Um, 100 percent bonus appreciation looked at this earlier so that would also uh, being able to take 100 percent of the cost of that asset that's placed in service uh, would also be eliminated on income over four hundred thousand um, dollars. The next bullet uh, is, you know, very big in the Nashville area and probably Clarksville as well. Um, a little bit like kind exchanges. Uh, a few years ago, we're, we're, uh, you could use it for uh, lots of different asset classes. Uh, most popular were like vehicle sales, to where you could sell an asset, and then as you would have a, any kind of tax consequences on that appreciation. Uh, as long as you bought a like-kind asset. Well, the Tax Cuts and uh, Jobs Act limited that to real estate only, to where you're going to do a 1031 on real estate activity. Well, under the proposed plans, that like-kind exchange or 1031 exchange would be disallowed for any property type. Um, so it could be a big deal for um, individuals in the real estate realm. Uh, the next one's actually kind of a pro. Um, so the, uh, currently there is a cap of $10,000 um, as far as what you can deduct on the federal return uh, for what you pay in state income tax. It typically doesn't affect us a lot in Tennessee if we don't have an individual income tax, but if you do business in states like California, New York, New Jersey, or you live in those states, um, you know, then obviously this tax uh, limitation can very much affect you. Uh, well, under the proposed plan, this limitation would be eliminated. Um, so really good news to people who live in a high tax state where they could deduct potentially more of their state income tax on their federal return uh, kind of going forward. 
Um, and the biggest one, I've gotten more calls about this one than any, anything else, but um, currently the capital gain rate uh, and qualified dividend rate is set to a cap of 23.8%. Uh, technically the capital gain rate is set at 20%, but there's also that 3.8% uh, net investment income tax that applies to certain um, investment income. Uh, so really, if you combine the two, that's how you get the 23.8%. Well, under the proposed plan, um, that rate would increase to 43.4% on income over a million dollars. So that's 39.6% cap rate plus that 3.8% is that 43.4%. Um, so that's a huge change um, on the uh, on a long-term capital gain. Um, you know, uh, a lot of clients are concerned about this. So again, I uh, want to reiterate, none of this has you know, been passed. Um, I think a lot of it personally will come down to what happens in the Georgia runoff election in January. Uh, so I think if you can, if you see Republicans keep control of the Senate, um, you know, maybe none of this gets passed or we have a very watered down version um, of these proposed changes. Um, however, if Democrats gain control of the Senate, then you know this could very well become a reality. Um, at least part of it could. So um, it's very, you know, it's, when it, it's on the horizon. I want to make everyone aware of it. Uh, nothing's happened yet, but um, you know that election in Georgia can very well determine, you know, if we have another tax reform bill that's um, you know sweeping, or if we see you know, very few changes um, to what we have now. So. Um, I think that's all that we have for today. So if you have questions, um, Emily Blinn said we have that chat option. If you want to ask them there, I'll try to open that. Um, if you want something, you know, a little more individual, don't want to share with everyone, feel free to email or give me a call. I'll be happy to, you know, discuss any questions you may have. Um, Lynn, do you have anything else that you want to add for now? Or do you want to take questions or... Well, I uh, know I uh, was looking at the chat box. We don't have any questions. Uh, you've still got uh, just a minute uh, to go ahead and type something in there if you're wanting uh, to ask something really quick um, to Marcus. Um, but uh, while I'm waiting on that, I will say thank you for joining us today. Um, I know we've provided a lot of details and information. Um, so what we're going to do, um, I'll be sending a PDF version of the PowerPoint out to you in the next day or two um, so that you can go back and review as needed. Also, we will be putting the video uh, version of this up on our YouTube channel and on our website podcast. So uh, be sure to tune in there. Hopefully by Friday, those will be up there. Um, if you need to go back and review um, a section or um, uh, a tidbit, and then you can um, send an email to Marcus. You see the, his email address there on the screen. So um, I do want to thank you all for attending, and I don't see any questions. So I guess at this time, uh, we will uh, say goodbye. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.